Today, we're reacting to Muhammad Ali Jr.'s fights from back. The ones that didn't go so well. In the back of the universe, it doesn't matter how powerful you think you are, you'll have to put your life on the line to prove it. This is Ali Jr.'s most unforgiving weakness. He is an incredible athlete with speed, power, and technique, but unlike many of the other fighters in Baki, he is unprepared to face the possibility of his own death. Muhammad Ali Jr. was trained from a very young age by his father, Muhammad Ali Sr., the legendary boxer who refined his boxing into a near perfect martial art. Under the guidance of his father, Muhammad Ali Jr. became a world-class athlete in his own right and claims to have perfected his fighting style, improving upon the techniques that were passed on to him. This is all well and good, but does it hold up when your opponent is a ruthless fighter ready to die in the name of victory? He defeats Gokai Shubukawa, Dopo Orochi, and a couple of side characters. Then with a couple of wins under his belt, Ali Jr. becomes a little bit overconfident and challenges Jack Hanma to a fight. This is where the trouble begins. We've seen Jack Hanma on this channel before, a man whose intense training regimen and PED cocktail have granted him near superhuman physical ability. He's an absolutely vicious, by any means necessary type of fighter, and I'm not sure that Ali Jr. was ever ready for this type of challenge. Ali Jr. is able to land a couple of blows, but when Jack is unfazed, he seems a little bit shaken up. Then Jack delivers a kick to his midsection that sends him flying backwards into a concrete wall. Blunt force trauma to the back is a fantastic way to break ribs, fracture the scapula on the back of the chest wall, injure intrathoracic organs such as the lungs, and possibly even fracture the posterior aspect of the skull. Any of these injuries could incapacitate Ali Jr. and put him out of the fight. However, showing a resilience that is common to Baki's characters, Ali shakes it off and soldiers on. <laughs> From this point moving forward, Ali seems to be on the defensive, fending off Jack's grappling attempt with a few more insignificant blows. Jack lifts Ali into the air and throws him like a doll into another crash landing onto his back on the concrete floor. Yeah, you know those injuries that I briefly described before? That move would make them worse. Considerably. Ali Jr.'s chest wall would be a mess of rib splinters. His lungs would be contused, lacerated, or even punctured by rib fractures. A pneumothorax, a hemothorax, or even a pneumohemothorax would be likely at this point, as might be a flail chest, making breathing very, very difficult. Without prompt medical attention, the average person might not even survive. Then we have a series of brutal punches and stomps to the head and face that leave Ali Jr. in a crater on the concrete. <laughs> Jack Hanma is very thorough, taking a moment to inspect his victim for signs of life before continuing his onslaught. So sick. Clearly, punching someone in the head while their head is trapped against the ground is not a good thing, but punching them so hard that you fracture the concrete underneath is significantly worse. A typical one and a half inch slab of concrete requires 1900 newtons to break. This would mean that a minimum of 1900 newtons of force had been applied to the top of Ali Jr.'s skull. A Journal of Neurosurgery article has stated that it takes approximately 2300 newtons to fracture a human skull. So 1900 newtons is getting very close to the Humpty Dumpty threshold. But. Just because Jack is not one to shy away from extremes, he decides to take it to another level by following this up with a foot stomp to the front of Ali Jr.'s face. If Jack's punch nearly cracked Ali's head against the concrete, Jack's curb stomp would be more than enough to finish the job. And given that Jack stomped Ali right across the bridge of his nose, the damage here would be catastrophic. We could expect bilateral orbital fractures and a Lafort variant maxilla fracture as well. 
These bones would be pushed back into the skull, with some bone fragments possibly perforating the brain case. This would be an injury with a significant degree of lethality. And were it not lethal, Ali Jr. would likely require permanent supportive care because we could expect his cognitive function to be significantly reduced as a result of the brain trauma associated with this type of injury. Jack then steps gingerly away from his opponent. Finally, my masterpiece is complete. And I can rest easy now. A word of advice for anyone looking to take on Jack and Emma. Stay down! When, by some minor miracle, Ali Jr. stands up, Jack has no choice but to finish the job in a decisive fashion. As if the curb stomp wasn't decisive enough. A savage strike to Ali Jr.'s knee makes it hard for him to stand. Fortunately, this punch is only designed to momentarily incapacitate Ali's leg to slow his advance. Jack strikes Ali on the outside aspect of Ali's knee near his fibular head. The perineal nerve courses around the fibular head in this location. A blow to the nerve here will cause a transient neuropraxia or nerve injury that will cause the common perineal nerve not to work properly. This will prevent ankle dorsiflexion, causing a foot drop, making Ali pretty freaking clumsy. As if a caved in face would not do that first. Jack takes advantage of Ali's shaking legs and delivers an uppercut combo, boom, psh, targeting Ali's chin and ribs. And even though it looks like Ali's guard is in place for the body shot, Jack's strike has enough force to do considerable damage anyway and sends him flying back first into the concrete wall for the third time in less than a minute. Jack adds to the tally of facial injuries by delivering an uppercut that is almost certainly likely to cause a mandible fracture to go with the maxilla and orbital fracture he has already caused. And just because the previous blunt force trauma to Ali's back wasn't enough damage to the thoracic wall, Jack delivers a devastating blow to Ali's ribs in the front so that he can leave Ali with a matching set of bookends, rib fractures, front and back. Even with his back against the wall, Ali retains some of his confidence, sure that no matter the challenge, he can stand and fight. Obviously, he never met Jack Hanma. And of course, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. So Jack delivers one last punch to Ali's face, thoroughly caving in his already crumpled bosom. Unfortunately, he slams Ali's jaw shut on his tongue, causing Ali to bite through his tongue at its tip. Talk about excessive. This combination of facial injuries would require extensive reconstructive surgery that would need to be completed in a staged fashion over several operative sessions. Recovery would be prolonged and painful, and Ali Jr. would likely to have some sort of permanent facial disfigurement. But backy fighters aren't normal. After his fight with Jack, Ali Jr. was injured pretty badly, but in Baki, you really don't get any time off. There is no injury report in underground fighting tournaments. So, in his weakened state, two former opponents come to take their revenge. Gokai Shibakawa claims the first time he and Ali fought, it wasn't a real fight alluding perhaps to the levels of competition present in the show. You can fight someone like a competitive boxer might fight them, or you can fight someone with every ounce of your strength until one of you is inches from death. It sounds as though Gokai thought the first fight was in the former category and that he withheld some of his power. This time, he makes short work of Ali, twisting his pointer finger into oblivion. Is my finger supposed to bend like that? Crushing his face against a nearby tree multiple times and slamming the back of his skull against the ground. 
Gokai uses a joint lock of the index finger to control Ali where he hyperextends the metacarpal phalangeal joint to its maximum range to elicit significant pain. Normally, most people can accommodate approximately 90 degrees of extension at this joint. But here, Shibakawa forces the joint beyond the end range, where either a metacarpal phalangeal dislocation, a phalangeal fracture, a flexor tendon rupture, or some combination of the above is likely to occur. With next to no effort, he throws Ali through the air using only his grip on the index finger and smashes him into a tree face first. Now, at this point, Ali would still be recovering from his facial annihilation that was delivered by Jack Hanma only a short time prior. So getting smashed into a tree face first would not be included on the facial reconstructive surgeons list of post-operative instructions. Given that the implants used to fix Ali's face would be quite delicate in nature, 1.5 and two millimeter screws and contoured mini fragment plates, the force resulting from this type of impact would be more than enough to destroy whatever work had been completed by the surgeon. Attempting to reconstruct Ali's face a second time would prove even more daunting a task since there would be less bone available to work with due to the fixation already present. And let's not forget the facial lacerations that would occur as a result of Gokai scraping Ali's face down the full length of the tree trunk. I'm beginning to feel like these fighters work for Ali's facial reconstructive surgeon and that this is a medical make work project. Then it's Dope Orochi's turn. Unlike Gokai, Dopo seems to think that his first bout against Ali was more or less fair. He simply wants a rematch and a chance to redeem himself. And he doesn't seem the least bit daunted by Muhammad's injured state. In fact, he is determined to add to Ali's list of injuries. He begins by countering Ali's punch with his forehead, doing a number on his attacker's hand. Fractures and dislocations, once stabilized, are relatively comfortable, causing little discomfort. However, even the slightest tap can cause excruciating pain if these injuries are displaced, as we see here. But not one to shy away from an opportunity, Dopo takes advantage of Ali's weakness, countering Ali's punch with the top of his head, one of the strongest parts of the skull. Ali suffers an open fracture of the second and third metacarpals as a result. Now, if you know anything about striking, you will know that most of the force in a punch is delivered by the striking surface created by the proximal phalanx of the second and third fingers. If you break the second and third rays behind these fingers, you remove all the support structure for your striking surface, which leaves you unable to use that hand to strike effectively. Dopo, knowing this, delivers a brutal kick to Ali's hand, adding a number of phalangeal fractures and dislocations to the constellation of hand injuries that Ali already possesses. That leaves Ali Jr. in dire condition, especially considering that he is a boxer and his fists are his main weapons. This is not world-class boxing that Ali is used to. This is back. His repeated attacks leave Ali's hand an unrecognizable mess. Given the extent of the damage present, these injuries are more akin to those suffered in an industrial accident than those suffered as a result of a street fight. Care of these injuries would require immediate surgical care with a washout of all open injuries within six hours of injury to prevent infection. As with Ali's face, repair and stabilization of these hand injuries would likely occur in a staged fashion as the extent of injuries would be too great to address in a single operative setting. Recovery for these injuries would also be prolonged and it is quite possible that Ali's hand would be permanently stiff and unable to make a fist in the future. It would be a real possibility that Ali's fighting days would be numbered following this trauma to his hand. Dopo stomps Ali's foot and delivers a blow to his already extended knee before turning his back and walking away without pause. Striking the top of Ali's foot with the heel of his shoe, Dopo opens a wound on the dorsum of the foot and causes a foot fracture in the midfoot, likely at the level of the metatarsals. Then a direct blow to the front of the other knee is enough to knock Ali backwards off balance. With this being only a punch and not a kick, the damage associated with this blow is likely to be inconsequential relative to the other injuries that Ali has already suffered. But another open fracture and then a forced hyperextension of the contralateral knee are just enough to leave Ali hobbled without an ability to mobilize or defend himself. <laughs>
With an ever-growing list of injuries, Muhammad does not attack Dopo as he walks away. Perhaps he is starting to understand what it means to fight in the back universe. And finally, Ali has the opportunity to fight Baki himself. I missed? He's so fast. He got me. Not exactly off to a great start. Even after all the punishment that Ali has taken, and after being knocked unconscious for a moment on the tournament floor, he is still confident in his abilities. Knocking me down like that was your only chance to win. But you let me get back up. Now I'm ready. <laughs> Yeah, but a swift kick to the cojones will rectify that confidence real quick. I'm still going to. <laughs> it might also leave you singing like a fuss from that point on. Now, I'm not a urologist, but I can say with confidence that a groin kick from the second strongest fighter in the world is likely going to cause some testicular trauma. It is quite possible for a testicular rupture to occur where the testes themselves are crushed between the foot and the pelvis and split open like crushed grapes. Not a good look and likely to require emergency urologic surgery if Ali hopes to have Ali Jr. Jr.'s running around in the future. It could also cause an injury to the yeah, well, let's not even go there. Suffice it to say that the groin kick is a very effective way to stop your opponent in their tracks. Very effective. Welcome to Backy. Hey, bud. You wanna keep going? <sighs> Confidence will only get you so far. Backy then delivers a crushing stomp to Ali's head. You're about to die. Nothing to really add here other than that Ali's face has already seen a lifetime supply of trauma and would at this point be looking something like the TV show Bosch after all of his reconstructive surgery. Baki then scoops Ali up gently and attempts to end his life with a rear naked choke. This choke is a type of submission hold that is often used in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and mixed martial arts. Generally speaking, the rear naked choke is a type of headlock. It is primarily a blood choke, slowing the transit of blood to the brain. Although it can be used as an air choke, stopping breathing as well. If you apply pressure using your forearm against your opponent's trachea or windpipe, causing tracheal compression, that is termed an air choke. If the forearm is placed on the arteries on the side of the neck, this is termed a blood choke. Either can be used to incapacitate an opponent temporarily. However, if held for long enough, it can also be used to kill an opponent, as was Baki's intent here, if it weren't for Muhammad Ali Sr. Well, Ali Jr. might not have made it out of the episode alive. I guess that's what happens when you push your luck a little bit too far in the Backy universe. If you like this breakdown, be sure to let me know in the comments. If there's another fight you want me to analyze with a critical medical eye, let me know that too. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho.